This video was produced by Good evening. Welcome to the Wilson Hall Auditorium. My name is Chanel Morani. If you don't know who I am, Chanel pronounced exactly like the perfume, just spelled differently. I'm the director of the John C. Wells Planetarium and a member of the physics and astronomy faculty. We're delighted to have Dr. Clayton here visit our campus and to give us a talk about the end of the world and how you shouldn't worry too much about your Christmas exams, right? Yeah, so it's not that simple, unfortunately. So just a couple of housekeeping things before we get going. Hopefully a lot of you know that we have a planetarium, right? Fantastic. The John C. Wells Planetarium is a one and a half million dollar state-of-the-art hybrid planetarium. You guys pay for it, so you should come and see us, right? Saturday afternoons at 2.30 and 3.30, we do free shows uh, for the public. We invite members of the Harrisonburg community as well as JMU students. Our 2.30 show typically is family friendly, so you know it's an animated, full dome video. So this is not mom and dad's planetarium, right? This is a state of the art. It's in high depth. It's in five one surround sound. It'll blow your way if you have not seen a full dome, high res uh, planetarium video before. So 3.30, we have uh, you know, more scientifically mature. It's not a cartoon. Uh, so next month, which starts in two weeks, uh, in October, we're actually premiering our brand new uh, full dome video, Sesame Street's One World, One Sky. Now that's not for you guys, but you should come. Yeah, I mean, Elmo's in it, and I, you know, I love Elmo just as much as my three-year-old. Uh, and I've seen it a half dozen times. It's actually really good. So that's at 2.30, but at 3.30 is actually Origins of Life. You know, one of the greatest questions that science uh, is actually endeavoring to answer is the possibility of life outside of our planet. And this is a full dome video that explores that question. So you hear about exoplanets, planets outside of our solar system literally be discovering every day. And this is now taking one step further, looking at that question of whether life may exist on some of these distant worlds. So it's a really exciting show. I hope you come by. After every full dome video, we actually raise our star ball, which is our, our really uh, sexy piece of equipment. It allows us to show you the nighttime sky in a very real, very authentic way. And that's what separates us from a lot of other planetaria in the United States, is that we have both these capabilities. I hope you come out. We started augmenting our Saturday shows with solar telescopes set up in the courtyard in front of Miller Hall. If you didn't know what the planetarium was, it's in Miller Hall. Um, 1103 Miller Hall. Uh, so if you've never seen the sun, this is a great way to see the sun. It's an H out. It's a very particular wavelength. Oh, thank you very it's much. A very particular wavelength that shows you the sun like you've never seen it before. So you want to come and check it out. It's really cool. Really neat. Uh, the last Friday of every month, we have public star parties over on the other side of campus, where physics and astronomy is properly located in that little mini Stonehenge looking like complex. That's where we uh, set up our telescopes. Those are our pedestals where we put our telescopes on. We invite members of the community to come and look through it. If you've never seen Mars, Saturn and its majestic rings, Jupiter and its Galilean satellites, you know, you really ought to see it. It should be on your bucket list. Mars and Saturn are up right now. It's setting really quickly. Tomorrow night is, of course, last Friday of the month. It doesn't look like the weather's going to cooperate. Uh, if Friday doesn't work, Saturday is usually our fallback day, so we'll see if we get one of these dates in. Otherwise, we'll try it in October again. Uh, come the end of the semester, you'll see Jupiter and the four Galilean satellites. And I just think it's tremendously cool and, and really exciting to see if you haven't seen it before. The moon, binary stars, or other objects that we can get through. Horby like lit skies here in Harrisonburg. It's a really unique opportunity for you to come and check that out. Uh, we're on Facebook and Twitter, JV Planetarium. So if you're on Facebook and Twitter, please like us, please follow us. It's a great way to find out about events like this and other stuff we're doing. Uh, we're uh, really excited in the spring semester. The deputy project scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope. It's a billion dollar plus observatory to be launched no earlier than 2018, which is political speak for probably 2020 or 2022, <laughs> a long time from now. But this is the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, the project scientist is going to come on campus and give a public talk about why you, the taxpayer of the United States, are funding this billion dollar observatory and how we're going to learn a fantastically large amount of wealth uh, from this observatory, more than we've learned from Hubble and Chandra and Spitzer, these other great observatories. Uh, without further ado, I know I've talked about much along. I want to introduce our speaker. We're delighted, honored, and very privileged and fortunate to have Dr. <laughs> Phil Plate uh, come on campus to come and speak to us. This would not have happened without the generosity of the Department of Physics and Astronomy, the College of Science and Math, and the JMU STEM Center Outreach. So I want to thank them. Thank you. Give them a round of applause.
making this possible. You know, I, I, I told uh, my friends and colleagues that you know, if I get five or ten people, I'd be excited. Uh, this auditorium holds something like 1,300, and I think it's more than half full. So this is absolutely fantastic that we've got such a large turnout. And again, it tells me, confirms to me that you know, there's an appetite for this kind of intellectual enrichment. And I thank you for coming and making this so success. Uh, Dr. Phil Plate actually earned his PhD down the road from the University of Virginia. Uh, you can make your own conclusions. <laughs> but um, as, a, as a graduate student at UVA, um, he was uh, very interested in debunking a lot of the bad signs you see in our pop culture, propagated in our films and our TV shows. Um, and uh, it was a newspaper article he wrote for a local a campus paper that actually was the start of his career. And I actually steal a lot of his stuff. Uh, some of you came and saw The Core, a horribly bad movie uh, in the planetarium, and we debunk it afterwards. It's actually a lot of support that Bill Plate has put on his Bad Astronomy site. He has a book called Bad Astronomy where he debunks a lot of this. Um, after graduating from UVA, he actually was a support astronomer at NASA Goddard. Uh, the Goddard Space Flight Center is a big NASA facility just outside of Baltimore that actually operates many of NASA's missions, and he was a support astronomer as part of the Hubble Space Telescope uh, before he decided he wanted to uh, focus his career on science education and public outreach. He has more than 200,000 followers on Twitter, something I'm very jealous of. I have like five. Um, so several orders of magnitude. Uh, he's been on the Late Late Show with Craig Ferguson. Uh, he's, of course, authored two books, Bad Astronomy and Death from the Skies. Uh, he's had his own show on the Discovery Channel. And as I learned last night on Twitter by reading his tweets after he arrived in Harrisburg late last night, he actually was just filming footage for a new show uh, that's going to be something about the sun. All right, that's all you know. So that's all I know. Yeah. You don't know nothing. Uh, I don't know anything about the sun. I'm not even sure why they hired me, but all right. <laughs> so look for that on uh, the Discovery Channel soon. So I'm going to shut up and invite uh, Dr. Phil Clayton. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <sighs> wow. Okay. Um, thank you all for having me here. Uh, one thing I've just learned is that I've been pronouncing uh, Chanel's name incorrectly. Uh, sorry about that. Um, also, I should have had a lot more coffee if I'm going to be keeping up with uh, his, his pacing up here. Um, uh, I, can, I can try to get all excited right now. All right, good. Um, um, also, uh, golly, there's all that, all that stuff you were talking about. I was thinking about that uh, Sesame Street planetarium show is such a great idea. And I wonder if they'll actually tell us what Manamana means, because I've always I've wondered about that. Um, people of a certain age chuckling there. It's actually my wife's uh, ringtone on her phone. So I always hear that, Manamana. <laughs> Miss, oh. um, uh, Neil Tyson has more Twitter followers than I do, so you know, what are you going to do about that? And um, Neil's an old friend. And oh, I was going to ask, who is the speaker? Who's coming to talk about uh, James Webb? Oh, nice. Okay. Wow. All right. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, he's, he'll, he'll do better than I do up here. Um, he's like a real scientist, you know. I'm, I'm just up here talking about nonsense conspiracy theories. Uh, but that is, that is what I do, and it's actually a lot of fun. Um, up, uh, <laughs> up until the point where I'm beating my head against the wall, uh, dealing with some of this stuff. But it, it's, it's true. I, um, I spent a lot of my time doing real astronomy, if you want to call it that. I've, I've been an amateur astronomer my whole life. Um, I studied at Mr. Jefferson's University. Uh, my, actually, my daughter pointed out, said, oh, you're speaking at both places where uh, the founders actually wrote the Declaration of Independence. And I thought, oh, that's really cool. Um, or the Constitution. My American history is terrible. We have a Constitution, right? I can't remember. Um, uh, that whole freedom of speech thing throws me off sometimes. Um, so I, I love being back here. It's fantastic being back in central Virginia. I spent so much time here. And I, I was thinking about it coming down last night um, as I was driving through that epic thunderstorm. I, um, I've only been to Harrisonburg once, and that was in high school for a marching band competition because you thought I couldn't get any dorkier, could you? <laughs> and uh, and <laughs> I played trombone, so there's more, right? And what I remember is it was December in uh, 19... And um, <laughs> it was super cold, and all of, our, uh, all of our valves and slides were freezing, and we were using antifreeze on our instruments to keep, them, to keep them moving. And so that's what I remember about Harrisonburg. And now I live in Boulder, and I'm thinking, how cold can it possibly get here? Uh, it's, it gets pretty cold where I am now. Um, that's a fond memory. And actually driving past the, uh, the stadium here and seeing the mountains in the background really brought me back right away 
to that time a long time ago, and it was kind of freaky, uh, but, but cool. And um, it's, it's a shame to think that this will all be destroyed in a couple of months. And that's why I'm here. Uh, so I, I've talked about a lot of stuff in my time, people who don't think the moon landings are real. Uh, I, have a, I have a whole talk about standing eggs on end on the first day of spring, on the spring equinox, I know. Uh, it, but, but also uh, making fun of movies and asteroid impacts and all kinds of stuff. Uh, but this one, this, this particular talk, this is something uh, I decided I had to start doing. Now, I'll ask you, um, just, I'll just, oh, oh, look, there are people out there. Um, so how many of you heard the Earth's going to be destroyed on December 21st, of 2012? I assume some of you are raising, oh my gosh, actually a lot of you are raising your hands. Okay, um, great. Now I don't have to see you anymore. I'll just, uh, that, that's the only audience participation part, except for the laughter, always acceptable up here. Um, I, you know, this idea, this mind apocalypse idea has been around for quite some time. And it started to sort of bubble up in my own consciousness about five or six years ago. And I thought to myself, you know, this has got sort of epic conspiracy doomsday theory all over it. Uh, it's got ancient history, it's got a tenuous and totally incorrect tie to actual reality. Um, that's always a plus when you're talking about a doomsday theory. Uh, and it makes it very hard to disprove, actually. And it also has a deadline, and boy, oh boy, are deadlines important. If you have some sort of nebulous doomsday, you know, it's, it's going to happen in the next thousand years, you're not going to get anybody throwing money at you. But if you say, you know, December 21st, 2012, you're going to scare people and you're going to, you're going to be able to squeeze them for money. Now the thing is, well, and, and not necessarily money, I'll, I'll get to that. Um, it's not just about money, but, uh, uh, <laughs> but there is a lot of money involved. And uh, you got to realize, this isn't the first doomsday, it, at least the first doomsday idea that people have been, have been coming up with. It's not even the first doomsday idea this year. And some of these things you probably will have forgotten about. Here is a list of just ones starting in the year 2000, which of course is the future, because it's the year 2000. I, always, I still think of it as a future. It's like 12 years ago. Um, May 5th, 2000, there was going to be a planetary alignment which was going to destroy the Earth. Remember this one? Remember the day the Earth wasn't destroyed, just like every other day? No? OK. <laughs> um, three years later, also in May, uh, Planet X, Nibiru was going to pass by the Earth, and it was going to kill 90% of the people on the Earth, and earthquakes, and, and tides, and scary stuff. And um, nothing ever happened with that either. Um, at that point, I was starting to think that, why are these things always happening in May? And then I realized it's because people don't want to pay their taxes. Uh, <laughs> Planet X was pretty big back then, um, and then that went away. Uh, the next one, uh, there were a couple in between, but the next big one was asteroid TU-24, which is a dinky little rock which didn't come anywhere near the Earth. But then YouTube came along, and people were making conspiracy videos on how this, this asteroid was going to hit the Earth. And I, I made a video that said, well, actually, no, it's not going to come anywhere near the Earth. And then they were saying, well, it's going to magnetically connect with the Earth, and things are going to happen. And it's like, no, it doesn't make any sense. And then that came and went. There have been a couple of other asteroids since then. But then the next big one was last year, um, again in May, uh, and then again in October, because why do it once when you can do it twice? And that was Harold Camping, who was uh, a biblical apocalyptonist, uh, apocalyptonist, apocalyptonist, I don't know what the actual uh, grammatical form of that would be. Uh, he was a doom crier, and he was saying that the that Judgment Day was going to come in May, and then May came and went, and he went, uh, I'm in October, and then October came and went, and, and so did his theory. So that's gone. But these things, they come and they go. It happens all the time. It's something about the way our brains are wired. We love a good conspiracy theory. We love a good doomsday idea. Uh, and then when they go away, we forget, and then we reset, and it comes back again. And this one has come roaring back. This idea, this 2012 one is, is uh, doomsday in a big way. And I'm going to be making fun of it. Uh, don't, uh, don't have any doubt about that. But there is a serious side to this. This is scaring a lot of people. And I get, I get emails from people, and I have friends who get emails from people who are really honestly scared about this. Um, somebody asked me today, you know, what's, what's the walk away point? If, after your talk, what do you want people to walk away with? And I said, well, I want them to walk away understanding is the world's not going to end on December 21st. Uh, why is uh, sort of secondary, but, that's, but it's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, and, and, oh, man, do I get people asking me, is the Earth going to be destroyed on December 21st, 2012? And I say, well, 
maybe. Um, I can't say, no, I'm a scientist. Maybe something will happen, but it's really, 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 really unlikely. Um, I'm, not, I'm not concerned about it. Um, I'm far more concerned about unending terrible movies about this sort of topic. <laughs> um, how many of you here have seen, oh, I guess I lied, there is more audience participation. How many of you have seen this movie, actually? Not that many of you, excellent. You should be watching better movies like The Core and Armageddon. Um, and I'll, I'll say, actually, honestly, I like The Core. I know it's a terrible movie and terrible science, but I actually quite enjoyed it as just a romp. And it's, you know, it's about these guys who go down into the center of the earth to do stuff. I don't really remember what exactly. Uh, but it was a fun movie. And I talk to geologists sometimes, and, and, I, and they say, um, you know, oh, that movie, The Core, I hated it. It was so terrible. And I'll say, well, I kind of liked it. And they say, well, what movie did you hate? And I say, Armageddon. And they say, oh, I love that movie. And I thought, yeah, you, you know, scientists like the movies that don't pick on their particular science. So uh, that works out best for us. Um, but in this case, when this movie came out a few years ago, um, it basically stars John Cusack and giant cracks in the earth. I think that's, that was the, the two major stars of this movie. Uh, it's just him in a car, in an airplane, in a boat. I think at one point he's on a, a rickshaw uh, running away from the earth trying to swallow him up. And after a while it gets pretty tiring. Um, and the thing about this movie is, from what I understand, and I've researched this as much as I can, so I'm pretty confident about this, is that this movie was not titled 2012 until 2012 became popular. And then they changed the title of the movie to sort of ride the wave of, of, the, of the popularity of this doomsday thing. And if you've watched the movie, there's nothing about 2012 in it. I don't think they mention the date. Um, there's certainly no Mayan prophecy in it. This is in, in somehow the, the sun is emitting super neutrinos, which are somehow heating up the core of the earth and causing giant cracks to open up and John Cusack to barely escape with his life. Uh, and um, that's a, there's a whole paper on this, I think, that was published in some scientific journal. Um, that was a joke. Uh, <laughs> laughing at the explanation more. Okay, got it. Um, so uh, it, it, it's very strange. You know, there's nothing really about 2012 in the movie, and yet it really, I think it helped promulgate the idea of this doomsday. Uh, they, they marketed this movie in a viral sense. They had these uh, websites promoting some of the ideas in the movie, but it never really said this isn't real. And it never said it was from a movie. It just kind of talked about, the, it, the websites at least, talked about the Mayan prophecy uh, and, and promoted it. But, it, you know, if you looked, like at the very end or at the very bottom, it said, you know, Sony Pictures in like a little tiny font that was two pixels high. And, you know, it seemed a little unfair to me and a little, a little you know, slimy in my opinion. Uh, but the movie did help promote the idea of a 2012 doomsday, at least... Um, if, in the public consciousness. If you hadn't heard about it before, you might have heard about it then. Now it's everywhere. Um, uh, 30 Rock had a trailer for their season this year where they talked about the end of the world. So it's, it's totally mainstream now, and at least they were making fun of it. Um, and, and there is absolutely nothing to this. It, it, one of the things about uh, some of these ideas is that at least they're sort of kind of sort of based on science. There might be something going on. It's just misinterpreted. This is just made up out of thin air. It's amazing. Um, there's like one or two places where it sort of sort of nicks reality and then skews off again into land. Um, and I'm, uh, let me, let's talk about where this started. Okay, so first of all, does this start with a Mayan prophecy? No? Kind of? A little? Um, it does have to do with the Mayans. It does have to do with their calendar. Uh, it turns out um, it starts and ends there. It, it, uh, it, it's based on the Mayan calendar, but it's a huge misinterpretation of what's going on. Now, the Mayan civilization was, in, um, was, was spread out over um, uh, South and Central America. It was at the height about a thousand years ago. Um, this was a civilization that was actually fairly sophisticated. They had decent sized cities that had thousands of people. Their architecture is fascinating. They had those, those big pyramids, the step pyramids called ziggurats. Uh, their astronomy was excellent, as most ancient, you know, these aren't ancient peoples, but as most ancient peoples or older peoples were, um, without city lights to, to ruin the sky. And because they're an agricultural society, they have to understand seasons and timing and such. Um, they paid attention to astronomy. And so their astronomy was actually excellent. They knew the length of the year. They knew the periods of some of the planet's orbits. 
uh, things like that. They can predict phases of the moons and eclipses, all that sort of stuff, um, because they observe the sky for long periods of time, centuries. And when you do that, and you realize that there is a year, the sun takes a year to go around the sky, because the earth takes a year to go around the sun, uh, you, start to, you start to build up this sense of patterns. And when you start having patterns based on time, what you need is a calendar. So the Mayans had a calendar, and it was actually sophisticated enough that it's actually kind of a little bit hard to understand all the, all the cycles and everything. Now we have um, ways of measuring time. We have seconds, minutes, hours, and days, right? And then bigger periods, we have weeks, months, years, centuries, well, let's say I skipped decades, decades, centuries, millennia, um, so we go up to a thousand years. Um, most of these times are arbitrary. The only two physical times are a day, the time it takes the Earth to spin once on its axis, right? And a year, the time it takes the Earth to go around the sun. Everything else is arbitrary. A second is, is sort of made up. It's, it's, a, it's, it's just a unit we kind of made up. There are 86,400 of them in a, in, a, in a day, if you want to think of it that way. And I, I imagine some of you are looking to grab your phone and go, see, 3,600 seconds in an hour. Oh, yeah, look, 86,400, great. Um, but that's made up. And 60, minutes, 60 seconds to a minute, 60 minutes to an hour, those are all arbitrary. But the day and the year are fundamental. Every calendar has those. And it turns out the Mayans did as well. They have, um, but, but they looked at things a little bit differently than we did. So they had their own, their own language, uh, which is an awesome language, actually. It sounds like Vulcan or Klingon, actually. It's really cool. Um, they had a unit of a day. So, and and, and so that's, what, that's what this is telling you. We, what, what we call a day, they called a kin. And it's hard to do that sort of glottal stop because I'm, I'm tragically white. Um, <laughs> so I'll just call it a kin. Um, and that's one day. And 20 days, you know, we have a week, which is seven days, or a month, which is 28, 29, 30, or 31 days. Yeah, because we've evolved so much in, in, in all this time. We're, we're smarter now, right? So yeah. um, these people weren't stupid by any, by any remote means. Um, they had wh what you can think of as a month is 20 days, or 20 kin, and they called that a weenal. I, I love these words. It's so cool. Uh, and the last column is, is how many, what we would call a year, 365.25 days. And um, this is a fraction of a year. Now, 360 kin, they, uh, which was 18 win all, 18 times 20 is, is 360, they called a tun. Right? I think it's, it's actually kind of a there's, a, there's a stop after the end, so it's tun, like that. It's very hard to pronounce. Um, 360 is an awesome number. It's divisible by a bunch of other numbers, 180, 90, 45, 30, 12, 15, 18. It has a lot of divisors, so it's a useful number if you're trying to make a big unit that has a lot of little units in it, like the length of a year, and then smaller units like weeks and months. And the year is, of course, 365 days long, which is really close to 360. So a lot of people would have a calendar that's 360 days long, and then those five days would become holidays or government days. They had a lot of different ways of doing that. But it, it just it, it makes things a little bit easier. Um, so that you can, you can think of their tun as being one year, 360 days. But they had bigger units. Um, 100, uh, um, let's see, make sure I've got this right, because it, it starts to get a wee bit complicated. So one tun is like a year. 7,200 7, days, which is 20 tun, about 20 years. We can think of that as like two decades. They call that a katun, a katun. And then 144,000 days, 20 katun, or 400, roughly 400 years, was called a baktun, which you kind of have to hit yourself on the back and, 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 and say that correctly. Um, baktun. Um, 394 and a third years, very roughly 400 years. Um, so that, that's kind of neat. And, and so they had all these different cycles, kind of like we did. And just like we did, you know, you have to pick a day to start the year. And we picked January 1st. Totally arbitrary. As an astronomer, I think we should pick the first day of spring, the vernal equinox. And a lot of civilizations did that. Um, but that's not the way things work anymore. Um, they had their own way of doing things, and they had their, their sort of the first day. And it, it didn't correspond to our calendar days very well. It changes all the time. And uh, because their, their calendar had 360 days and ours has 365 plus the leap year, so it gets very confusing. Um, but you can, you, just like translating from metric to, to, to imperial units, you know, like a meter to a yard or whatever, you can convert their calendar to ours and figure out where all of these cycles start and end. And it turns out 
that um, uh, we're in a baktun right now, one of these 400 year periods, and it's coming to an end. Guess what day it's coming to an end? It's coming to an end on December 21st of this year. That's going to end this 400 year period. Um, the question you should be asking yourself at this point is, yeah, so what? Right? Who cares? It's just the end of a period, right? We, ha we have this all the time. Um, we, we have a, at the end of the year, you have a calendar up on the wall, and you get to December 31st, 2012, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to be you're going to be dead, right? Because the world's coming to an end. So let me pick another year. Um, what did you do in 2011 with your calendar on December 31st? You took it off the wall and you hung the new one up, and that's really all there is to it. The Mayan calendar had cycles. It has all these cycles to it: the 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 Baktun, the Tun, the Winal, all of these things. They they start, they finish, and you go to the next one up. And you you know when one when one smaller cycle ends. You, you, you tick the next one, the next bigger one up one, and then you start over again. If that sounds familiar, you know, it's a little bit like an odometer on your car when, if you look at that picture, you can see that's about to trip over to 100,000. Um, what does that mean? Well, it means you have to get your car in for a checkup, right? That, that's really all it means. It's, it's just a number. Um, at the end of the year, the world doesn't come to an end every end of the year. Um, you just, like I said, you get a new calendar. It's, that's all it is. Now, we do, in fact, have rituals that we do at the end of the year. Um, we have parties, right, on December 31st. It's uh, January 1st is a holiday. We tend to think about New Year's resolutions. We look to the future and say, how do, how do I want to improve myself? Um, what can I do better this year uh, than I did last year? You know, it's a time for reflecting on your life, and it, that's fine. It's, it's arbitrary, but we love arbitrary milestones, and, and so why not? Why not take a chance to do that? Um, so uh, the Mayans did that as well. Um, nobody's laughing yet. I'll wait for you guys to catch up with the title there. Um, yeah, ba bak the there you go. You kind of got to say it in your head, don't you, to get that right. Um, so they had, the way they measure their calendar, they call it a long count, and it's all these different numbers, and so you have, a, you have the tun, the wanal, the, um, the katun, the baktun numbers, all those things are in there. So, you know, when you write our date out as, for example, um, September 27, 2012, 9 27, 2012, it's similar to this, right? Each, each date has its own place in the number. And you can see that somebody has gone, I got this from Wikipedia, I checked it, it's actually pretty accurate, um, a list of when each new baktun started. And you'll see we're, we're, we're the, one, the last one started on September 18, 1618 and we're in the 12th one, and it's gonna click over to the 13th one on December 31st, 2012. And f the thing is, okay, there's another Baktun. There's gonna be the 14th one, the 15th one, and so on and so forth. These things keep going on. And in fact, there are bigger cycles than the Baktun. Um, and, and their names, there's the Piktun and a couple of others, and they, they're bigger cycles yet. They're bigger than 400 years. And actually there are, when you, when you read Mayan, um, hi, uh, Mayan, Mayan writing on some of, their, uh, some of their ruins, you see that they were actually talking about events hundreds of thousands of years in the future, millions of years in the future. So um, it doesn't make sense that, the wor that they would think that the world would come to an end on December 21st of this year if their calendar kept going and if they, they literally talk about things happening even farther in the future. Um, so right away, you know, this should, this should be raising some alarm bells. Like, well, the Mayans didn't, didn't say anything about the end of the world, and they really didn't. And in fact, you know, if, if they were so good about prophesying the future, how come they couldn't figure out that their civilization was collapsing, right, hundreds of years ago? There are still Mayans around. They're, they're in lots of places. Um, the fascinating culture, actually. And like I said, their language is awesome. Their, their word for uh, iguana is shtolak, and it starts with an X. So any word that has, you know, X-T-O-L-O-C, that's so cool, especially for a huge Star Trek dork like I am. Um, anyway, I, I learned that when I was in Mexico. So there you go. Now you know, too. Shtolak. Shtolak. It's just fun to say. Shtolak. Um, so they didn't, they didn't actually say the world was going to come to an end. And as a matter of fact, they didn't even really have, you know, you hear these things like, well, they were talking about renewal and a time of, you know, the gods were going to cleanse the earth or it was a time, of, you know, something good was going to happen. It's like, no, there's nothing like this. And it turns out that this whole thing started in the 1980s when this guy wrote a book, sort of a new agey, touchy-feely, crystal healing kind of a book, talking about the Mayans and he didn't, he didn't give a date, and he didn't really talk about their calendar that much, but he did kind of say there was this time 
uh, in the future that was going to be the sort of cleansing and renewal and all that. And then over the years, this got twisted and, and reshaped and reformed into the conspiracy theory we see today. Um, you know, for, luckily for conspiracy theorists, um, the time of the end of the Bakhtun uh, coincided with some time in the near future, in the next you know, 20 or 30 years, back in the 1980s. Now that's 2012 and it's coming up. But that's it. Right? The Mayans didn't talk about this at all. This is all nonsense. It is based on nothing. And uh, people still talk about it like it's really something. And I think that's fascinating. So what happens, you know, a, a, a good conspiracy theory is hardly ever going to let the facts get in its way. Um, and, and oh my gosh, we could talk about that all night long. Um, do you know that Evian backwards is naive? How about that for a conspiracy theory? Um, <laughs> It's too bad this is Dasani water, but there you go. Um, so uh, um, what happens is that, so, so now you've got this great conspiracy theory, and the world's going to come to an end, but you know what? People are getting more savvy. They're getting smarter. They're getting more intelligent. We're going to have to figure out something better than just saying the Mayans doing this. That's only going to get to a certain segment of the population, these ancient cultures and their mysterious knowledge. We need something better than that. Where, what can destroy a planet? And you think, what's the first thing you think of, right? Astronomy. There's a lot of stuff in the universe that can wipe out life on Earth. It's tried really hard. It hasn't done a very good job. We're here. Um, dinosaurs, not so much. Um, but we're here, so uh, we've been able to survive. But there are actually a lot of things you can talk about that can damage uh, or wipe out life on Earth or even, in essence, destroy the world. Um, now, it can't just be any random thing because it has to have a date, right? It has to have a December 21st deadline. So it's got to be something that will happen on or around that date. And so the, a lot of these folks who are out there selling books and making History Channel documentaries, I'm sorry, documentaries, um, <laughs> have come up with a, a lot of ideas. And here are a few of them, and, and these are all the ones that I've seen. These are the big ones. Uh, that I, this, this, one, the, this one's interesting to me, a planetary alignment. The planets are going to align, and their gravity is going to cause earthquakes, rip the earth apart, throw it out of its orbit, make cats and dogs live together. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly uh, what all the claims are, but uh, that's an interesting one because it's relatively new. I, had, I didn't see that one until a couple of years ago. Um, and in, in the older stuff about 2012, it wasn't there. Planetary alignments have a long and very terrible history of predicting the end of the world. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, our friend Planet X, which I mentioned was going to destroy the earth in 2003, after that came and went, except it didn't come or go because it doesn't exist. Um, after that sort of conspiracy theory came and went, I publicly said, you know, mark my words, this will be back. Uh, this idea of a, of a rogue planet. And I think I even said 2012 is when this thing's going to come back. Um, I was right, sadly enough. Um, solar flares. You've been hearing a lot about the sun acting up and throwing hissy fits all the time. Um, that's a good one. Uh, uh, sadly, though, like everything else, it's wrong. And I'll get to that in a moment. Um, but my favorite, oh, I love this one so much, um, is the sun's going to align with a black hole and that's going to destroy us all. Um, except it won't. So, but other than that, um, all right, so let's take these in order. Um, planetary alignment, quick and easy. Um, there are planets out there. Uh, when I was a kid, there were nine planets. Um, now there are eight. Um, which is weird because actually there are thousands. Uh, Chanel mentioned that we, we know of um, uh, lots of them, uh, it counts over 800 now orbiting other stars, and we, have, we know of many more that might be. They just haven't been confirmed yet. But we have eight big planets in our solar system, um, and if you want to count Mercury, which is still pretty small. Um, but when you think about it, you know, Jupiter is really big. It's got... Um, uh, uh, like a thousand times the volume of the Earth. You could fit a thousand Earths in it, and it has 300 times the Earth's mass. It's this huge planet, and uh, its gravity is very strong. So you can imagine if the Earth lines up with, the, with Jupiter and Saturn and these other planets in some way, and you add their gravity together, that's got to be dangerous, right? That, that can't be good. And it turns out, um, uh, it, no, this happens all the time. Uh, there was this idea that, that the planets were going to align in, in 1982, and destroy the Earth, and it didn't happen then. Um, it's not going to happen now. If you do the math, actually, and it's not hard, it is really, really simple algebra, um, really, really simple algebra, you can add up all the gravity of the planets. And what you find out is that even if they all align perfectly, you know, Mercury, Venus, Earth, all the way out to Neptune, um, 
and you add up all their gravity, it's a fraction of the moon's gravity. In other words, the moon literally has 50 times the gravitational force on the Earth as all the other planets combined at best. And you may notice that as the Earth goes, or this is, is, excuse me, hmm, want to be on camera saying that. Um, <laughs> as the moon goes around the Earth, um, it's not destroying us every month, right? And so all the planets lining up has nothing to do with anything. But wait, there's more. The planets aren't even lining up on December 21st, 2012. And this is what kills me. Um, I did this crazy thing of looking up where the planets would be on December 21st, 2012. This is software I have for my iPad. It was like three bucks. You can get it for your computer. It's called Sky Safari. You can get all kinds of software. Some of it's free. Some of it costs more. But you can find this stuff. And I said, December 21st, 2012. This is the, uh, by the way, the universal language of typing something into Google. And um, you know, where are the planets going to be? And I got this great map. And so this is the whole sky. Um, sort of so the whole sky above you sort of flattened down. And if you look up here, if you're facing, this here's north, down here is south. This is really hard to do if, if I'm not looking actually at the, at the tablet. This over here, so here's uh, west and east. So if you're facing one, you know, if you're facing west, you're sort of seeing that part of the sky in that direction. If you're facing north, you're seeing that part of the sky in that direction. And um, if you see here, I just did this for sort of the middle of the day. Um, here is the sun right here. Here's Venus and Mercury. They actually get kind of close together. That's pretty cool. Saturn, Mars, Neptune, Uranus, if you want to pronounce it absolutely correctly and not have people giggle at you. Um, most astronomers call it Uranus, which is how I pronounce it, but that kind of sounds like an adjective. Um, you know, that room smells funny. Slightly Uranus to me. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so it's not, not any better. And, and there's the moon, right? Now, if the planets were aligning physically in the sky, you would be see they would all be in a line, and you'd be looking right down that line. They would all be clustered in one tiny spot in the sky, just like, oh, wait, just like they aren't here, right? They're spread out in a line all across the sky. They're in a line because our solar system is flat, like a DVD. And so we're sort of looking out at the planets, and so they're all sort of around us in a big circle in the sky. Um, and they're spread out everywhere. So they're not, they're not even aligned. And I can show you this even better in another graphic. This is like if you're looking down on the solar system from a distance. Up here is the inner solar system, so there's the sun. Mercury and Venus, here's Earth, right? So if we're standing here on Earth, which <laughs> luckily we are, and I'm looking towards the sun, right down, down uh, to, the, to the, where the sun is in that drawing, Mercury and Venus will be close to the sky together over here, just like they were in my diagram, right? If I want to look at Mars, which is over Oh, oh, shoot, I was afraid of that. Here we go. Dun, 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 over here, that's going to be to the, if you want to think of it this way, to the left of the sun. Mercury and Venus over here. There's Mars. Now we start looking, now we go back to look at here. Here's the sun. The Earth is up at the top of that square. Jupiter's behind us, right? Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. I've got to make sure I get this right. Uranus and, Net or, yeah, see to the, mm, do this. That way. Uh, yeah, so Uranus and Neptune are off to the side again. So all these planets are spread out all around us. So they're not even aligned. Not even aligned. And I keep hearing people making this claim. And it's like, really? Really? Um, all you have to do is look it up, and you'll see that that's wrong. So planetary alignment, brr, nope, sorry, gone, done. Um, get used to seeing that red line, because it's going to show up a lot in this talk. Next is Planet X. You may be familiar with the movie. Um, <laughs> You may not be. Um, I have seen every flippin' science fiction movie ever made, uh, if, if starting from like you know Metropolis up to the mid 1990s before they were making so many. I, I lost count, um, and I've never seen this one. I was really shocked when I found out there was the man from Planet X. Um, there was also a Daffy Duck cartoon, Duck Dodgers in the 24th and a half century, with Planet X. Anybody's nobody's one one person. Okay. Yes. Awesome. All right. But he makes up for it with enthusiasm. Oh, I see some people here. Awesome. That whole Duck Dodgers episode is fantastic. It's so funny. But it features Planet X. Um, Planet X has been around for a while uh, before Pluto was discovered. They, they, and, and sort of X, you know, means unknown, not necessarily 10, like the Roman numeral. And they said, you know, maybe there's another planet out there. And they found Pluto. And um, that, you know, they called that Planet X, even though it was the ninth planet. And then when they found out it was really small, they thought, well, maybe there's still another planet out there, planet X, which then would be the 10th planet. Um, there were these ideas that it was pulling on Uranus and Neptune. 
Uh, and it turns out, no, not really. That was just a mistake. Uh, the reason that came up, I can talk about that a little bit later in the Q&A if you want. Um, but the point is, there was, there's just an idea that there's another planet out there. And there were, there were some conspiracy theories in the 50s and 60s that it was out there and that it caused all of the biblical disasters, um, the, the, the plagues of Egypt and um, uh, uh, the, in, in, um, in Revelation, the part about uh, the sky will become as black as, 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 as sackcloth and, and the moon will be as red as blood and all that sort of thing. All of these, these ideas, there was, there, were, there was an author who wrote about this, Velikovsky, and he said, you know, all of these biblical disasters are tied to these weird events. This became, uh, this, that came and went, uh, it got warmed over by a guy named Zachariah Sitchin who wrote a bunch of books called The Twelfth Planet and other things like that. And it's like 12 planets. And it's like, oh, well, he's including the sun and the moon. And it basically the ancient Sumerians uh, were visited by aliens from this 12th planet. And I thought, if, and they got all this advanced knowledge. And I thought, if they got advanced knowledge, didn't they happen to mention that the sun is a star and not a planet? You know, that's kind of the first thing I'd tell them. Um, but anyway, so this idea of this 10th planet swinging by the earth and its gravity and other things causing all of these literally biblical disasters um, has, has, has sort of waxed and waned in popularity over the years. And that's what the 2003 apocalypse thing was. It was, um, it was this 10th planet which had been called Nibiru in these, in these books by Sitchin. Um, and and cl clearly he was wrong, at least as far as 2003, 2003 goes. And it's come up again, just as I said it would. Um, and in, uh, not that I was a real genius about this, it's just that you know, somebody has devoted their life to this idea and, and when it doesn't come to fruition, it's, it's really hard to just turn your back on all that. It's much easier to say, oh, you know, I meant to carry a two. And, and it's not 2003, it's 2012. Um, the thing is, people keep seeing Planet X. This pesky little planet keeps showing up in people's pictures. Um, here's a picture of, a, of an orbiting solar observatory. Uh, I've got this straight off of a website where they say, look, here's Planet X here, right? This is a solar flare. This is some sort of orbiting moon. And in fact, none of this is correct. Um, that's actually a bright star. That line going through it is just an effect in, in some cameras you get because of the way the electronics work. That loop is actually what's called a lens flare or an internal reflection. Light hits the lens of a camera and it bounces around, it scatters around inside of the lens and it can form all these crazy geometric shapes. If you saw the Star Trek reboot, you may be familiar with lens flares. Um, really? That's, that's all the laughter I get with that? It's, it's been a while since that movie came out. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, <clears throat> you guys keep a lot more air than I'm used to here. <clears throat> I live at 5,000 feet, so the humidity here is killing me. Um, and the orbiting moon is just another star. So this is just a complete misinterpretation of this image. But people do this, and it, it's weird. You know, if, if I had an image from a NASA observatory that had all this weird stuff in it, you know, what would I do? I'd think, well, I'd ask a scientist. I'd ask somebody who's familiar with it. Now, of course, NASA's part of the conspiracy. Um, they're hiding all this information, so you don't go to them. But you could go to an astronomer. Um, of course, I'm part of the conspiracy, right? I'm, I'm a NASA scientist, although I've never been paid by NASA. And if you read my blog, I make fun of NASA quite a bit when they screw things up, which they do. They're a government organization. Um, I love NASA, but it's a real love. It's not a rah-rah love. It's like, you know, I love you, which is why I'm telling you, you know, you're screwing these things up. It's, you're killing me because I love you so much, but we gotta, we gotta have this talk. Um, it's that sort of love. So, I, you know, I won't hesitate to call out NASA when they do something ridiculous. So, uh, it doesn't make any sense to me, but they, uh, clearly uh, they would rather have a conspiracy than not. And it's so easy to look at these pictures and misinterpret them. And when you think you're right, you think you're right. So you blog about it, right? Here's another classic one. I love this one. The setting sun. And they say, look, there's, a, there's Nibiru right next to the setting sun. And I'm thinking, have you ever looked at the setting sun? It's bright. And if you try to get a picture of it, it's hard because it's so bright. And if there's anything sitting next to the sun that shows up in your picture, I'm guessing it too will be bright. And so if you have a picture of this thing, why didn't everybody see it? It's there. There it is. It's brighter than the full. It's almost as bright as the sun. Look. And nobody seems to have seen it, including the person who took this picture. They didn't say, look, two suns, and took the picture. No, they took the picture, looked at it, and went, oh, look, an internal reflection, stuck it up on the web, and then a conspiracy person went, Nibiru! And that, that's, that's what happens. 
And, and you guys think I'm kidding. I'm not. I mean, this is really how this stuff goes, right? Um, here's another one. I love this one. This one was making the rounds. Here's uh, uh, Nibiru is, is, is generally talked about as being a red star. And it, these, these were the moons. And it turns out this is just a completely hoaxed picture. It's just somebody it took Adobe Illustrator or whatever and just made this fake picture and said it was a Russian photograph of Nibiru. And it, it went through all the rounds, cracked me up. Um, that somebody would think that. Um, I can go on and on. These are uh, a, a, a subatomic particles that have hit a detector in space, like protons and neutrons. They slam into the detector and they leave these weird things. See this all the time, but this is the winged planet. There are these things about a winged planet. And, and so they, 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 they made that fit. And I, I love this. Um, Zach Wiener, who does the Saturday morning breakfast cereal cartoon, if you've ever read that, one of my favorite cartoons. Not for if you're if you're young, don't read it. It's terrible for your for your brain. Um, but if you're a grown up, awesome sauce. Um, and he he actually he says this in one of his cartoons. Like, if you have to ask a question in your headline, the answer is no. Um, and it's true for here. I love this. Is this the real thing? Well, no, it's not. I mean, that's just again that is just a picture of the moon or something bright and a reflection inside the camera. It's not actually. Um, it's not actually Nibiru. And, and here's another one from Sunset. There's, that's clearly a reflection. Um, you can find these pictures all over the web. And they're all the same thing over and over and over again. It cracks me up. There you can. Um, there's another one. It's like, ooh, Nibiru's an eclipse. What's going on there? I don't know. Um, OK, so Nibiru is just made up. But there's a physical thing going on here that I can tell you is, is why I know that this planet, does, A, doesn't exist, and B, even if it did, can't possibly be affecting us. Here's a model of our, or a drawing of our solar system. The sun in the middle, Mercury and Venus aren't shown because their orbits are too small. But you can see the Earth's orbit, and then Mars, and then the asteroid belt. That's where Han Solo was avoiding the TIE fighters, I believe. And then um, Jupiter. Now. The, the, the scale of the orbits is about right here. Um, Jupiter is five times the distance from the sun that the Earth is. So um, it turns out it's, it's, um, it's like 400 million miles or something like that. It's a huge, it's hundreds of millions of miles, a long distance away. Um, Jupiter's a gas giant. It's the biggest planet in the solar system. The claims for Nibiru is that it is a brown dwarf or a gas giant planet. A brown dwarf is like a, a sort of a failed star, super planet kind of a thing. But it's, it's at least as big as Jupiter. And it's on its way into the Earth, and it's going to pass us on December 21st. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Jupiter is hundreds of millions of miles away all the time. And yet, it is the fourth brightest natural object in the sky. Sun, moon, Venus, Jupiter. There, the, the space station actually gets brighter than Jupiter sometimes as it passes overhead. So Jupiter, hundreds of millions of miles away, is bright enough that it dominates the night. And it's actually bright enough to see during the day if you have sharp eyesight. Um, it's incredibly bright, hundreds of millions of miles away. Nibiru is going to be passing us in a couple of months, supposedly. So it's got to be super close, right? Our spacecraft take years to get to Jupiter, and they are screaming fast. They're rockets, right? So they're moving really, really fast. It still takes some years, because hundreds of millions of miles is a really long way. It, it takes eight, seven, seven or eight months to get to Mars, and Mars is way closer than Jupiter. So if Nibiru is just a couple of months away, it's got to be really close. And if it's really close, it should be really bright. Here's a picture I took in my front yard of the moon. There was a gorgeous halo around the moon that night. It's caused by ice crystals in the air. It's similar to a rainbow. Um, different, but similar. Um, really beautiful. That bright spot is Jupiter. Jupiter was obvious. The full, uh, or a nearly full moon was right next to it in the sky. And I could see Jupiter hanging there in the sky. It was gorgeous. Um, here's another cool picture of Jupiter and the moon. Just to let you know that Jupiter is very bright from hundreds of millions of miles away. If Nibiru is the same size, then it's, and it's reflecting sunlight, which is why Jupiter is bright, and it's very close, it would, it would be the full moon would pale in comparison next to this planet looming in our sky, about ready to destroy us. I haven't seen anything like that myself. Um, of course, I never look at the sky. I'm an astronomer. <laughs> so uh, I believe I can uh, have a little appearance here by my friend the red line again and say, look, planet X, uh-uh, not buying it. But then we have solar flares. This is kind of, this is kind of interesting. Solar flares. Um, Here's the sun. This is a picture taken using ultraviolet light. Um, the sun, when you think of it, is kind of um, featureless. It might have some sunspots on it. But when you look at it in ultraviolet, um, it, you start to start 
you start to see the magnetic activity on it. The sun has a very complicated magnetic field. And that magnetic field stores a lot of energy. And this can sometimes erupt. And so our friendly nearby star sometimes is not so friendly. <laughs> um, Photoshop, I did that. That's so. <laughs> Copyright 2012. Um, so here's a picture of the sun. You can see some sunspots on it and some features. Now you've got to realize how big the sun is, all right? It's 860,000 miles across, 1.4 million kilometers across. Um, compared to that, the Earth is tiny, tiny, tiny. You would barely be able to see it here. Sunspots, even small sunspots, are bigger than the Earth. This is a comparison of a, of a typical sunspot cluster with the Earth there in the middle. And you can see these things are enormous. They're tens of thousands of miles across. And they are just huge repositories of energy. The magnetic field of the sun stores these energy up, stores these energies up like a, a I don't know, like a bank vault and money. It's just they, they, they build and build and build and build these things up. And sometimes these magnetic fields will snap. And if you think about like taking a piano wire and stretching it, stretching it, stretching it really hard, and then cutting it, right, it snaps really hard, really violently. And that's what happens with these, these magnetic field lines in the sun. They snap and release that energy. And when they do, they release huge, vast amounts of energy that completely dwarf the entire nuclear arsenal of our planet. We're talking about dwarfing it by factors of millions, millions of times the energy of every nuclear bomb ever detonated or that ever could be detonated on the Earth. Huge, vast amounts of energy. Um, when you look at these in the ultraviolet, you get this, a tremendous explosion of energy that we call a solar flare. Now, the sun's a long way off. It's 90 million miles away. Um, and these solar flares don't do that much to the Earth. But they can. Um, they send off a stream of subatomic particles. This can slam into our magnetic field. And there's complicated physics that go on. But it can overload our power grid. And we can get blackouts. This has happened. It happened in 1989 in Quebec. And they had a brownout for many hours in March when it's cold in Quebec. Um, and that, that was terrible. Um, that was not even the biggest solar flare that's ever been seen. The biggest solar flare was in 1859. It's called the Carrington event. It was this guy named Carrington who discovered it. And um, it was so powerful, um, it, was, it actually uh, was sending currents through railroad tracks and um, telegraph lines. Telegraph lines were being disconnected from their batteries, and they were still able to send messages back and forth from city to city because there was so much electricity flowing through the line due to a solar flare and, and other associated. There are other solar storms that happen along with the flare. But this was a monumental event. If something like this were to happen today, and it were to be aimed at the Earth, it would put the hurt on us. Um, it would overload our power grid. We would blow out transformers. And these transformers are huge, expensive, difficult to build machines that would take years to replace. So this could really damage us. And not only that, um, the, uh, the other effects from these solar storms can damage satellites. And we rely on satellites for the internet, for global positioning, for a lot of things. So having a big solar flare aimed our way could be dangerous. Um, and that's the, that's the Planet X claim, is that there's going to be a huge solar flare, and it's going, to, uh, it's going to hurt the Earth. Now, I'm not exactly sure how the Mayans knew about the solar cycle. Oh, I haven't told you about the solar cycle. Um, the sun's magnetic field strength gets bigger and smaller. It gets stronger and weaker over this period of 11 years, called the solar cycle. So you're at a peak. Five and a half years later, you're at a trough. And then five and a half years later, you're at a peak again. It's an 11-year cycle. And um, the sunspot number increases near the peak and decreases at the bottom. And with the, with the sunspots come these magnetic storms. Um, you may remember that a couple of years ago, we were in the middle of a long, long period where the sun was very quiet. There were no sunspots. It was really weird. I had never seen the sun that quiet. Nobody had. Um, and then it came roaring back. And a couple of years ago, we started seeing more and more sunspots. And because um, there are solar storms associated with sunspots that can damage our satellites. The idea of solar weather has come up, and people are very serious about it. When a satellite costs you hundreds of millions of dollars to build, you want to make sure it's going to work. You don't want some solar storm damaging it. So there is a solar weather prediction center. It's in Boulder, Colorado. I've been there. It's really awesome. It's like, uh, I hate to bring up Star Trek again, but there are all these computers and everything. It's like being on the Enterprise. And they're, they're checking the sunspots and everything. And they, make, they, they give out warnings if something's going to happen. And they also plot the number of sunspots over time. And you can see, starting in January of 2000, 
the sunspot number, it goes up and down, up and down, but you can kind of draw sort of a line through it. And in 2008, 2009, 2010, it was basically nothing. There was nothing going on. And then it started to come back up this year. This is good up until August 6th of this year. So this is fairly recent. And you can see we're back up, and there's sort of a predicted curve going on there. And what the, what the uh, Mayan apocalyptonists are saying is that the sun's going to be at a peak in 2012. We're going to see lots of these solar flares, lots of these things, and that's going to destroy our civilization. And there's a problem with this that I've been actually saying for a couple of years, uh, especially when the sun was quiet for so long, is that if you look at where the peak of the next sunspot cycle is going to be, it's going to be in 2013. Oops. Um, yeah, so that doesn't work out. And it gets worse. Um, you, that's when you get the maximum number of sunspots. Because of the way the sunspot cycle works, you don't get the strongest and most violent flares until after the peak. If you look at that peak up here, you'll see it's actually it's a double peak. That's very typical. And it wasn't until 2003 in November that we were getting huge flares from the sun. It was really tremendous activity uh, that had never been seen like that before. And it was you know two years after the peak. So we'll start seeing really big flares from the sun. And we've already seen some. You probably, I hope, uh, if you read my blog or if you just follow stuff down the internet, um, there have been fantastic pictures from space observatories of the flares, gorgeous pictures. Um, and we're not going to be seeing the really big ones even now for a couple of years. So. Um, I believe that was one of the four horsemen. <laughs> Calm your horse, sir. Um, so we can bring back my good friend, the red line. Um, that's not going to be there. They'll, and so finally, I'm at the last one. I love this. The sun aligning with a black hole. You have to say it that way. It's actually it's required by astronomical law. Um, we live in a galaxy called the Milky Way. It's a, it's, it's a couple of hundred billion with a B, stars like the sun, some smaller, some bigger. And they are all in a very thin, flat disk that has the spiral arms in it. And there's this central hub, uh, this region in the middle um, that has uh, other kinds of stars there. And it's huge. It's 100,000 light years across. And a light year is 6 trillion miles. The nearest star is four light years away. It takes light four years to get to that star. If you're on one side of the galaxy and you want to talk to your friend on the other side of the galaxy using a laser beam, I hope you have lots of patience because it's going to take 100,000 years for that light to cross the galaxy and then 100,000 years for, it, for them to reply. So the galaxy is, is just enormous. It's mind-crushingly huge. Um, the sun is located about halfway out from the center out to the edge. Uh, we're at 26,000 light years from the center, if you're keeping notes. Um, and that turns out is a long way. So wh wh what does that have to do with anything? Well, because we're inside this galaxy and it's very flat, it looks like we're seeing it edge on. We're inside of this, and we can look at it across the sky and actually take pictures of it. This is, a, this is an actual image made by an orbiting satellite that looked in the infrared. And it looks like it's taken from outside the galaxy, but it's not. We're in the galaxy. Some of it is behind you. Some of it's in front of you like this. And they just basically unwrapped the whole sky picture and put it in front of you. And you can see the galaxy is very flat. It's got sort of a central plane, which I can illustrate. This time, the red line is on my side. It's not xing something out. It's actually showing you where the mid-level of the galaxy is. And you can kind of think of that as like the equator. Like the Earth has an equator that's halfway between the North and the South Pole. The Milky Way has an equator, which kind of splits it into a North half and a South half. And again, for clarity, the sun is halfway um, from the center out to the edge. Now, the thing is, in the center of the galaxy is a supermassive black hole. Now, we know about a lot of black holes, and most of them are 10 times the mass of the sun, 20 times the mass of the sun. And we, we've known about these for some time. But it was discovered some years ago that there is one that has 4 million times the sun's mass. 400 million suns lined up and then all squished together. That's how massive this black hole is. And it's in the middle of the galaxy. And that's kind of scary. Do you think there's a black hole? We're going to die. And it's like, well, wait a sec. If you've caught one theme from this talk, it's that well, we're not really going to die. It, well. We are, but not now. Um, <laughs> sorry to bring that news to you. Um, so here's the midplane of the galaxy. Here's the thing. The claim is that the sun is going to pass in between that black hole and us 
and the gravity is going to align, and uh, those things are going to happen again. The earth's going to be torn in half, the tides, the floods, the cats and the dogs, all that stuff. Um, so what they're saying is over time, you can see, you know, if this is the midplane of the galaxy, the sun's position is going to be here, then it's going to be here, then it's going to be here. The reason the sun is moving is because the earth is going around the sun. So if we're here and the sun is here, on one day of the year we're looking at it, and I see it over against that wall. But a few months later, we're looking from this angle, Right? We're seeing the sun over there in that part of the sky. And it looks like the sun is moving around in the sky. It's in the different zodiac constellations. Scorpius, Libra, Capricorn, all those guys. I think those were the planets from Battlestar Galactica. Um, really, again, you guys need more dorks at your school, I think. Um, and it turns out that the, the, the direction in the sky towards the center of the galaxy is in Sagittarius. And that's where, the, that's where the central black hole is. And it turns out the sun does actually get near that part of the sky. Over time, as, as we see the sun moving across the stars, it's going to cross over the galactic equator. And I can show you this in a better, better drawing. This is again from my software, the Sky Safari software. You can see sort of the, the galaxy there. And there's the, the galactic equator. This here. Oh. I just did something horrifying. There we go. Oh, I put an X up. All right, fine. Um, let's see. Here we go. Why isn't my laser pointer showing up? There it is. So here's the galactic equator in blue going up this way. Here's the path of the sun on the sky called the ecliptic. And they cross right here in Sagittarius. And it turns out that's, but isn't that where the black hole is? And the answer is yes, but there's a slight problem, as you've probably already seen, because I hit the slide too early. Um, that X marks where the black hole is. So the sun is not actually directly lining up with this black hole. So the claim that the sun is going to line up with this thing and it's going to cause all these disasters is wrong. The sun doesn't even line up with it. It gets eh, kind of, sort of close, but not all that close. And it turns out you can, you can map where is, the, where is the sun every day. And let's map that. We'll say, how far is the sun from this black hole? Don't worry about degrees. It's just this distance on the sky. Every day in December, the sun gets closer and closer and closer and closer. And then it turns around and goes back up. When is it closest to the black hole in the sky? December, oh, oops, December 19th, not the 21st. Yeah, on the 21st, it's actually farther away. So if the world was going to get destroyed with the sun lining up with this black hole, it would do it on the 19th and not the 21st. Not only that, it does this every year. So you remember every December 19th when the, sun, when the Earth is destroyed? No? Yeah, it's because this is all nonsense. And what's even worse is that this, this distance changes every year for various reasons. And actually, every year now, the sun is moving farther and farther away from this thing. Um, the closest it ever got was in 1998. And uh, one of these guys who makes these big claims about the sun lining up with the black hole says, well, we're in the, sort of this black hole season. It's like, black hole seed, what is it, ripe? Can we pick it? What does that even mean? It just, just doesn't make any sense. Um, but what, so, okay, so so what? So what? Let's say, thank you. Um, so say we all. Um, uh, that's better, thank you. Um, so there's the position of the black hole, there's the position of the sun. So what? Well, let's look at this physically. Let's, sure, let's say the sun lines up perfectly with this black hole. Right in this, they line up exactly. The, this black hole, the sun, the earth, in a perfect line. You could hold a piece of string along them, 26,000 light years long. They'd line up perfectly. What would happen? Well, you can kind of guess what the answer to this is. Um, the distance from the earth to the, to the black hole is 26,000 light years. If you want that in kilometers, it's 260 gazillion, I think. Um, it's, it's a lot, a lot, a lot of distance. It's a huge number of, of miles. Um, you can calculate how much gravity we would feel from that four million solar mass black hole compared to the sun. And you think, well, it's four million times, right? It's like, no, it's not four million times because it's far away. It's really far away. And if you calculate how much gravity the sun has compared to that black hole, the sun wins. It's actually well over a trillion times the effect of the Earth that that black hole does. So if you line up the sun with a black hole, uh, it doesn't matter. It's going to add one trillionth amount of gravitational force to the sun. So a mosquito flying past your head actually has more gravity. And you may notice your head doesn't get ripped apart uh, every time a mosquito <laughs> flies by. Um, in fact, Mars, Mars, this, this cruddy, dinky little planet, um, which never gets closer than uh, a couple of dozen million miles from the Earth, has a thousand times the gravitational effect of the Earth than this black hole does. So once again, uh, the black hole is just nonsense. Um, these are the four big claims that you'll run across. 
And, and obviously, well, I shouldn't say obviously, but clearly you can debunk them. You can show that the claims themselves were wrong. And you can say, look, even if the claim is right, here's why it won't have an effect on us. And that's what I've done with each one of these things. But I could go, I could keep going on. Um, man, I'll tell you, these guys are nothing if not creative. You've probably heard about a pole shift. Something about the Earth's magnetic field flipping or the entire axis of the Earth flipping over. Um, super storms, that's another one. Super, uh, super hurricanes, they're going to scour the Earth clean. Um, my favorite is Betelgeuse going supernova of these things. That's a bright star in Orion that could explode. And last year there was a, 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 a shameful article in a newspaper that got picked up talking about Betelgeuse blowing up in the year 2012. That's not going to happen. Or an asteroid impact. And it's like, you know, the Mayans didn't know about asteroids. They didn't have telescopes. So I'm pretty sure they couldn't have predicted an asteroid impact. Doesn't make any sense. And none of these things happens on a schedule. So, um, you know, this pole shift can't even happen at all. It doesn't make any sense, or at least not the way they're describing it. Superstorms, you know, we have big storms, and our storms are getting, are getting more powerful. Uh, we seem to be having longer hurricane seasons, and, and they're getting stronger, um, most likely due to climate change. But I don't think the, uh, the, mines, the ancient mines knew about that, so I think I can cross that off. Uh, Betelgeuse going supernova. Betelgeuse might blow up in a million years, or it might go tonight. But, you know, I'll take those odds. 2012 is about to end, so there's like 60 days left out of, you know, how many days are in a million years? I'm thinking 365 million. Um, 60 out of 365 million is a pretty good odds to me, so I don't think it's going to happen. And an asteroid impact? No. If there were any big asteroid on its way here and it were going to hit us, we'd know about it by now. Um, so clearly these claims are just silly. They just, and they go on, and I could, I could keep, trust me, there are so many of these things I could keep going on. None of them make any sense. And you've got to ask yourself, why are they doing this? Why are, they do, why are they promoting this? Um, well, of course, you know, there are books and videos and History Channel interviews and all these kind of things that these people do. Some of them are convinced they're right. I've talked to enough conspiracy theorists to know that they think they're absolutely right. They're not, but they think they are. Um, some of them are probably uh, horrifying, soul-sucking, skeevy con men. Um, not that I would state my opinion clearly or anything like that. Um, but, you know, they're, they're scaring people on purpose. This stuff sells books. You can get on, you know, coast to coast radio or whatever and talk about this stuff and sell your product. And um, then but then you can turn around and say, well, you're selling your product, you're writing your blog, and you're giving public talks. And it's like, yeah, I have the advantage of being correct. Um, also, the universe is on my side. And I'll tell you something, uh, if you want somebody on your side, it's the whole frickin' cosmos. Um, so... The, I, the funny thing is, there is somebody who is profiting from all this, and I heard about this recently, and it brought such joy to my heart. The people who are profiting from all this are the Mayans, because they're still around. There's the, they're, the, you know, they had this big civilization that collapsed, but they're still there, right? You know, they're still Italians, even though the Roman Empire collapsed. Um, and it's the same thing, and you can go down to Mexico, and you can go to the, uh, the Temple of Khan here, which is phenomenal, it's huge. And it's this really, really, really cool ziggurat out in the middle of Mexico. It's really gorgeous. Um, and you can even get your, you know, your, your pasty white picture taken in front of it. Um, I, I, being there was awesome. I mean, these, when you go there and look at their observatory and how they set all this stuff up, it's phenomenal. These guys were good architects and uh, an amazing civilization, uh, what they could do. The fact that they could support you know, thousands of people living in a city clearly meant they had pretty good agricultural technology without, um, without having anything like the internal combustion engine or anything like that. They were still able to feed and, and care for their people. Um, and they had, a, they had a lot going on. It was a really cool, uh, uh, their culture, they had pretty good math. Uh, their math skills were excellent. Astronomical skills, agricultural skills, architectural skills, they really had it going on. Uh, and so it's cool that because of all this, people are going there. They're learning about the Mayans who are, who are alive today and, and investigating them. And, and these, there are books coming out and people doing documentaries about the Mayans. So in, in, in one sense, it's kind of cool. On the other sense, though, um, there are people being scared by this. There are kids who are reading about this and getting scared. They're on the internet looking it up. And all they're finding are these conspiracy theory websites. And uh, my friend David Morrison, who is an astronomer uh, with NASA, he does, he does a lot of stuff about asteroid impacts. He's kind of taken on the mantle of go-to guy about this. And he says, he's told me this, he gets email every single day from people who are scared. And, and uh, scared to the point of, of, of thinking about doing terrible things. 
And that is why I do this. That's why he does this. Um, astronomy is a lot of things, but it shouldn't be scary. For one thing, it's real. It's out there. It's amazing and gorgeous. Uh, who, who can look at a Hubble picture and go, eh? You know, it's, it's a galaxy. It's a nebula. It's Saturn. It's amazing and beautiful and mind-numbing and, 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 and incredible, and it's real. It's there. These are worlds that we visit. We just landed a, a laser-eyed, nuclear-powered mobile chemistry lab on Mars. This is what we do, right? That's why, thank you. This stuff, thank you, because I had a hand in that. Um, <laughs> I, I wrote about it. I was up at four in the morning typing it up on my blog. Um, but this stuff is amazing and it's real and it is so inspiring and so wonderful that it really makes me angry when people abuse it. Even if they don't mean to, even if they're honest and they think, they think what they're saying is true, it upsets me that they're scaring people about it and that's why I talk about it. Um, what is not going to happen is this, okay? We're okay. Um, I'm pretty sure the world is not going to end this year, in December 21st of 2012. And that, that asks the obvious question, well then what's left? And the answer, shockingly, is 2013 <laughs> and the rest of time. Use it well. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. And I'd also like to thank everybody for, for sponsoring my visit out here. This is a real pleasure. So we'll have the house lights up. And uh, we have two microphones set up. Uh, Dr. Plate is happy to answer questions if you want to come up to a microphone just so that everyone else can hear. Uh, he's also willingly agreed to stay afterwards. He's going to sit down here. If you've had books, posters, you want to get it autographed, take a photo with him, <laughs> yeah. tweet it, include us in it. That'd be great. Right, yeah. Get a tattoo of me on your shoulder. Um, yeah, I know I ran a little bit long, so it's, if you want to leave, go ahead. I know you've got your affairs to get in order before December 21st, so go ahead. Um, but, I, but I am happy to take questions. Oh, you jumped up really fast. But you're the one, you're the one who saw, what is it I said earlier, because you cheered. You were the, Duck Dodgers in the 24th and a half century. Yeah, that's right. Um, my question is more of a, a request for clarification. I know the answer here, but okay. Right. I, I know the answer, so I know where it came from, I know what the type of that, but I wonder if you could go into that a little <laughs> There are a lot of astronomical misconceptions, and it's funny how they come up. And they, uh, one of them is the Great Wall of China is the only man-made object visible from space. I love this claim because then I ask them, what do you mean? They mean, what do you mean, what do I mean? It's like, well, you, you say it's the only man-made object visible from space. What's space? Do you mean from low Earth orbit? Do you mean from the moon? Do you mean with the naked eye? Can I use binoculars? Uh, you know, what does this mean? And it turns out the, the Great Wall of China, um, if you do the numbers, is kind of sort of visible from orbit. Uh, the astronauts in the space station can see it. Um, but not because it's wide, but because it's long. It's actually very narrow, right? It's only, you know, 20 feet wide or something like that. If it were only 100 yards long, it would be really hard to see. But because it's very long, they can see it. And of course, at sunset, it casts this long shadow, which you can then see snaking across China. So you can see it that way. Um, but, but it turns out that's not true because uh, if you go to uh, my blog or, or just about any space blog, you'll see tons of photos taken from the space station. These astronauts now, on the space station, they have this cupola, a dome, which was put in there specifically for this purpose. I love NASA sometimes. They, they put up this dome which has windows in it which are kept very clean and they take pictures through it. And all these magnificent pictures of aurorae and the sun and the moon, but they also look down on the earth. And you can, um, because we're near in space, of course, you look down on the earth. Oh, look at those earthlings down there. And um, they can see cities. I, uh, one of my favorite pictures ever taken from space shows the boot of Italy at night. And you can see all the cities lined up. You can see uh, Basri and Rome and Venice and all these, all these cities lining it up. So y you can easily see a lot of man-made objects from space. Um, the pyramids, uh, cities, roads, um, one of the things that got me was an astronaut took this picture and couldn't figure out what it was. 
and it was this long winding light and, and it, it put it up on the web and people were trying to figure it out. And then it turns out it was, um, it was the border between India and Pakistan and it was lit up at night. Uh, and, and there you go. And they say you can't see borders from space. And the answer is yes, you can. When, when, when people get angry at each other for whatever dumb, petty reasons they have, and, and they, can, they light up their borders, you can see those from space as well. Um, and of course, from the moon, you can't see anything. The Earth is just a, a big blue ball in the sky. And you can see cloud patterns, and you can see the continents, and that's it. Um, all of the astronauts come back profoundly changed by this, saying when they see the Earth, when you can, when you can see the entire Earth, all at once and just cover it with your hand or your thumb. It really changes your perspective on life, which is uh, something I wish everybody could do. And I'm hoping in the coming years as private space travel gets cheaper and more people do it, we'll get more people who have a lot of money, which is important actually, uh, seeing that, getting that perspective, and that'll change everything. I bet you weren't expecting that answer, were you? <laughs> more? Just one question? Oh, hey. What happens when you fall into a black hole? Yeah. Well, I have a talk called Seven Ways a Black Hole Can Kill You. Um, so do I even, oh, I don't have it on this iPad. Oh, well, there goes my joke. Um, where's this talk now? Let's see, here? Yeah, I'll just put that back up. There we go. Um, yeah, all right. Um, that is actually an interesting question, and um, there are a lot of things that can happen to you when you fall into a black hole. Um, one is that you fall in and you die, and, and that's it. Um, that's not a very exciting answer, um, and, and it depends on the black hole. And if, for example, um, these big supermassive ones, like the one in the center of our galaxy, you would just fall in and bloop, you'd be gone. That's it. But little ones, and I'll try to make this brief, um, as you fall into a littler one, um, you can get really, really, really close to it. And the thing about a black hole is that their gravity is super strong. And gravity depends on distance. The farther away you are from something, the less gravitational force you feel. That's why this black hole in the center of our galaxy has no effect on us. Even though it's four million times the mass of the sun, it's, it's billions of times farther away, and that wins. So as you get farther away from it, it gets weaker. So as you get closer to it, it gets stronger. And if there's a little one, if you take the sun and crush it down to make it a black hole, it would only be a couple of miles across, a few miles across. So you'd have to squeeze it down till it's roughly the size of a small city, and then it'll become a black hole. But the cool thing is, is you're falling in, you say you're falling in feet first. Your feet are a few feet closer than your head, or your head's a few heads farther from your feet. I'm not sure which way that goes. Um, I usually use metrics, so I get confused with those units. Um, so your feet are closer, and it turns out if you do the math, your feet actually feel a much stronger force than your head. And as you get really super close, your feet can actually feel a force so strong, it'll actually stretch you. Your, your, your feet get pulled away from your head by a huge force. It's like somebody's hanging a battleship off your feet, literally. I mean, it's, I mean literally, it's that much force. And so what this does is this stretches you out. And as you fall in, you get stretched out like, like basically like toothpaste being squeezed out of a tube. And since you get stretched into this long, thin thing, we call this spaghettification. <laughs> and this is not a joke. This is the actual term. Uh, that's what astronomers call it. And so you'd be dead before you fall into the black hole. But it turns out by the time you get stretched into this thing and the time you fall in is like a tiny, tiny, it's like a less than a millisecond. So it, it wouldn't even hurt. You'd be... Uh, you'd be dead before you actually fell in. And that, that's two ways you can die. You can fall in or you can be stretched. It turns out there are, there are five other ways uh, that I don't have time to tell you about, but they're, they're awesome. Um, uh, including getting cooked by radiation, um, getting stretched like an accordion back and forth like this, um, uh, 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 being near one. Black holes can explode, but it turns out that's true. That, that guy, uh, Stephen Hawking, actually came up with that idea. Um, and, and so there are a lot of different ways. And it turns out it's very, these get very complicated. Um, there's a lot of math and a lot of physics, and it's really hard to understand all this stuff. Black holes are weird. Uh, they'd be weird anyway, but they're also difficult to understand mathematically and physically. Um, so if you're really interested in this stuff, you know where I'm heading with this, I bet. If you're really interested in this stuff and you want to find out, stay in school. Um, 
but also uh, study your math and science. Because if you want to understand how the universe works and have your mind twisted into a pretzel, because that's what this stuff does to you, which is great. I love that feeling. Looking at something and going, what? Uh, yeah, stick with the math and the science, because it'll, it'll take you places you, you can't even imagine, quite literally. Good question. You're welcome. <laughs> Somebody else pops up. Yes? Um, my favorite uh, theory of the destruction of the world is that uh, um, the solar system passes through the, the disk of the, the galactic plane, or the galaxy plane, or the, or the plane of the galactic disk, and it dislodges gravity waves, dislodge material from the solar cloud, and comets come spinning in, and we get hit by a comet. And maybe you can talk about comet rain. Well, that would be my other talk, death from the skies. Um, okay, so what, what he's saying is there's this, um, it, it's kind of two different things. There's this idea that because I said that the galaxy is flat and has this sort of equatorial midplane, the solar system passes through that. It, and, and the gravity somehow of the galaxy um, uh, can affect our solar system. And out, way out past the orbit of Neptune is this cloud of comets. They're, by cloud, I mean just like a, like a cloud of bees. I mean, it's not literally a cloud. It's just billions or even trillions of chunks of ice that are orbiting the sun out there in a big sphere around the sun. And they're, they're held by the sun's gravity very, very lightly because they're so far away, the sun's gravity's weak. And a nearby passing star or the gravity of the, of the galaxy itself can dislodge these things, send them screaming into the solar system where they can hit the Earth and, and do bad things. Um, I don't know. Uh, the idea of us passing through the plane of the Milky Way and doing that seems a little sketchy to me. Um, the, we do, in fact, as we, the sun orbits the center of the galaxy the same way the Earth goes around the sun but it takes 240 million years for the sun to go around the galaxy once. And what's neat is as it does it, it's bobbing up and down. It's take, it takes about 60 million years for the sun to go up and down as it's orbiting. You can kind of think of like a, a cork in, in a bathtub as the water's swirling down, and if you poke the cork, it'll bounce up and down as it's going around the, the drain. That actually works, or a ping pong ball or something like that. And that's what the sun is doing. It's sort of diving up and down. And it turns out there are all kinds of crazy things that can happen because of this. And, some people are trying to tie this to mass extinctions. There appears to be mass extinctions happening very, very roughly every 60 million years on the Earth. Um, the dinosaur impact was 63 million years ago. Turns out that's just a coincidence. It has nothing to do with this. But there are other things that, that, that are happening, these mass extinctions, starting with um, uh, the trilobites, the Ordovician, Silurian, or Devonian, I can't remember, I'm not a geologist. Um, uh, <laughs> When the, when the trilobites ruled the earth and then they got wiped out and starting then and, go, and, and coming forward there seems to be this periodic thing. It's hard to say. I've written about it. I wrote about it in my book and it's interesting. It's even maybe a little compelling but it's not proven by any means. So we don't know if that really happens. Um, we do know that asteroid impacts happen because we are not smart velociraptors. We are evolved from smart little guys who, were, who, who bur burrowed underground, mammals, and survived this giant asteroid impact. In 1908, something roughly the size of this theater slammed into uh, the Earth um, over Siberia and blew up with the force of a 20 megaton bomb. And uh, that was seen by a lot of folks. And uh, that happens. Chunks of stuff come and hit us. If you've ever been to Meteor Crater in Arizona, which is awesome, it's just so cool. There's a hole in the ground, it's a mile across. And that was from an asteroid impact. These things do happen, um, which is why we need to be serious about deflecting asteroids. And there are people who take this seriously. Like I said, I have a whole talk about asteroid deflection. It's a fascinating topic, and it's like right out of science fiction. But it is something we can do. Um, we can actually choose to save the Earth, uh, which is kind of an amazing thing. Um, uh, but if it's tied to the Milky Way, I'm not sure to answer your question. But it's a cool idea. Where's somebody over here, I think? Um, no. <laughs> first thing, second thing first, no, they don't travel faster than light. A neutrino is a, is a subatomic particle. You've, pro you know, you've heard of electrons and protons and neutrons. Those are the three things that make up matter, like us, you and me. And all of the elements, hydrogen, helium, lithium, boron, all those guys, that's made up of, of neutrons and protons and electrons. But there are all these other kinds of particles. 
Um, there are mesons and uh, uh, neutrinos and all these other things. And there's just a whole zoo of these things. And a neutrino is just a subatomic particle. Um, and it was predicted and then it was discovered um, a long time ago, decades and decades ago. Uh, and it turns out that um, it has to do with nuclear reactions. So if you're fusing hydrogen into helium in a bomb or in the core of the sun or something like that, you can make neutrinos. They make them in the Large Hadron Collider all the time. Uh, what happens is that um, the, the, the sort of this, what's called the standard model of particles, we kind of know how all these things behave. We know the mass of a proton. We know its charge. We know a lot about it. We know the same thing about neutrons and all these other things. But um, we study how they interact all the time. We want to know how they, how they talk to each other and form matter. So we want to study neutrinos. And one of the things we don't know about a neutrino is whether it has mass or not. Photons are particles of light. They're hitting you right now. They don't have any mass. Some particles do, some don't. The standard model predicts that neutrinos don't have mass. They're massless, just like photons. But something happened a while back. There was an experiment that was done that showed that they might have a little teeny weeny mass. And if that means, that means that they have to travel slower than the speed of light. Because anything with mass can't go at the speed of light. It has to go slower. It's just one of those rules. So what they started doing is they said, you know, we need to time these things. We need to take a neutrino. We need to make a neutrino here and then detect it over here. We know the distance between these two points, hundreds of miles maybe. And then we know when we set it off. We know how far it traveled. We can calculate its speed. So they did this. They created neutrinos in Geneva at the Large Hadron Collider. They had this enormous detector for these things in Italy. And they, they were firing these, these packets of neutrinos at the detector. And they discovered, as you probably read last year, that these neutrinos appeared to be moving faster than light. And the press went crazy. And every scientist I know, including me, went, yeah, I think they probably made a mistake. Um, it's, it's really against a lot of really important laws that you can't go faster than the speed of light. So it, you know, it, it, figured it must be some sort of measurement error. And they went through all that stuff. And they said, we checked everything. We don't know what's going on. Please look at our results. The scientists did a good thing. They admitted. This is what we have. We don't understand it. And then people started looking into it, and it turns out they had a faulty connection in one of their fiber optic cables. And when they connected it correctly, that faster than light speed went away. So you know, they went it, point A to point B, divided by the time they got faster than light. Once they plugged that fiber cable in correctly, everything went away. And it's almost exactly what we expected. Um, and it was, it was actually kind of a neat thing, because what they were doing was so interesting. I hadn't even heard of that experiment. But then once they made this mistake and made it public, I heard about it. All my friends heard about it. It became really cool. We were interested in it. And it shows you how science works, right? You screwed up. You made a mistake. You, you take it. Um, the guy who was the head of that project actually wound up resigning over it, which I, I, I think there was some internal politics involved. I don't know. But I thought that was too bad because I think he did this right, in my opinion. Maybe not by scientists who didn't want to be embarrassed. But in this case, they made a mistake. They couldn't figure it out. They admitted it. Somebody found it. They corrected it. They're done. That's how science works. So I thought it was a fantastic episode. Um, and also shows how the media doesn't work and how we need to, we need to be careful when it talks about science. Um, you have to be careful about what you read in the media. But it was fascinating. And let me tell you something. The other thing, we all wished it was true. Oh my god. It, you travel faster than light. Goodbye. My wife understands this about me. I said, you know, you know if we invent warp drive, I'm gone, right? Um, and she's like, yeah, I get it. So, you know, we have, an, we have an agreement, but it's, you know, it's based on us finding faster than light travel, so she's probably pretty safe. Or she wants to get rid of me. It's one of the two. <laughs> yes, hi. What's the biggest scientific, wow, holy crap. Um, <laughs> So do you want the original series, the next generation, Voyager, Deep Space Nine, or Enterprise? <laughs> or the movies, or the reboot? Now by the movies, I mean Star Trek, the motion picture, The Wrath of Khan, The Search for Spock, uh, The Voyage Home, uh, oh, what was the fifth one? Final Frontier, thank you. Um, I don't, I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, what was the biggest mistake they made? You know what's funny? Um, I'm a big Star Trek fan. Surprise. I love Doctor Who. Doctor Who is like my favorite show ever. Um, I met David Tennant. Ah! Um, yeah, let me tell you, he's totally dreamy. Um, and um, uh, it's funny because people say, you know, you make fun of the science in these movies like Armageddon and, and Deep Impact and all these things. 
how can you possibly like Star Trek and Doctor Who when they do nothing but screw the science up? And it's, it's like, because they're TV shows, right? It's a, it's a movie. I used to be really angry about it, but then I realized, you know, they're telling a story. And if the science gets in the way of the story, sacrifice the science. That's okay. It's a story. And, and uh, that's kind of a revelation that was really important to me, and I'm, I'm really glad I made it because now I can enjoy this stuff a lot more. Um, and and uh, so, God, when the doctor married River Song, oh my God, I was like crying like a baby. Um, spoiler. Um, spoiler from two years ago. Sorry, I think we're okay. That was the end of season six. So we're in season seven now, and I haven't watched any of them, so don't even tell me what's going on. Um, uh, what's the biggest mistake? In Star Trek, um, it, it, well, the point is, what I like is internal consistency, right? If you set a series of rules, you stick with them. If you can travel faster than light, I'm buying it, all right? I got it. I'm not going to worry about all the problems with physics and relativity and causality and all that stuff. I'm okay with it. You can travel faster than light. But you have to be consistent about it. People say, how fast is warp drive? Warp drive is exactly as fast as the writers needed it to be so that the Enterprise arrives at just the most dramatic time. That's how warp drive works, okay? Um, can you change time by going back in time in the TARDIS? Yes, because time is a wibbly wobbly ball of, right? And so I love these explanations where it's like, well, it's complicated and that's it. Um, but you have to be consistent. The, the, so it, so I have an answer for you. Um, season two, Star Trek Next Generation, um, uh, Dr. Pulaski gets a virus or something which makes her age really fast and she's gonna die. And so they say, I know, we'll get her DNA from a hairbrush and we'll pull that hair out and we'll use that in the transporter. It has a copy of her ma matrix in the Heisenberg compensators, you know, whatever. And then we'll, we'll, we'll put that back in her and she'll be young again. And it worked. And I was like, ah, ah. because, um, a hair doesn't have DNA, but maybe it had a follicle in it, so that's fine. But, but DNA doesn't make you young, and if her old body, her, I mean her young body is in the transporter already, couldn't you just beam her back into that? And then, and it's like, oh, oh by the way, we're now immortal, okay? <laughs> oh, I'm getting old. I'm gonna, I'm gonna beam my, you know, am I gonna beam myself back into a 22-year-old body? Yes, yes I am. <laughs> Look at me. Right? Speaking of which, the other scientific errors, they can't cure baldness 400 years from now, so awesome. Um, of course, some of us, you know, make it look this good, so. <laughs> Me and Patrick Stewart. Um, but I think, I think that, was, that was the one where I was like totally, yeah, I, I, oh my God, I can't believe they just did that. That was really funny. I can't believe I had an answer for that. That's awesome. And, and in many ways sad. <laughs> Is that it? You look, oh, yes. Yes. No. Yeah, I love, I, I get this question sometimes. Do you believe in aliens and do you believe in UFOs? And I say yes and no. Um, uh, it, it's, not, it's not really a question of belief. Um, f when I was a kid, we, we, we had nine planets, right? And that was it. Uh, we didn't know about planets around other stars. There were a couple of candidates, but we weren't sure. Um, but we didn't know. We had one example of planets around a star, and that was ours. There's nothing truly remarkable about our sun. Um, it's on the heavier end of the, of the scale of stars, um, but it's not special in any way that we can tell. Um, and there doesn't seem to be a reason why it would have a solar system and nobody else would. Um, but that became more clear in the 1990s when we started discovering planets around other stars. These are weird planets with that, which are much bigger than Jupiter, much more massive at least, orbiting really, really close to their star, much closer even than Mercury orbits the sun. And they're going around in a matter of days, not, not years like ours do. Um, but still, we started finding them and then we put up better and better telescopes and now we have the Kepler Observatory which has now discovered um, uh, many, many, many dozens of these planets and there are hundreds of these things known. And we have enough known now, and I love this, you start going from the discovery phase of something to the cataloging phase of something. You have so many of these things, like we have to catalog them now. When you do that, you can start looking for trends. And you can say, we have enough planets now that we can start dividing them up into things like um, star type. Like how many of these stars are like the sun? How many are bigger? How many are smaller? How many are old? How many are young? How many have 
Um, how many are mostly, are almost entirely hydrogen? How many have like as much iron as the sun does? The sun has a tiny fraction of iron in it. It turns out that's important. Um, and you can, you can just start looking at it and just dividing it up any way you want. And you see trends. And the amazing thing about every trend we see is once again, planets form frickin' everywhere. We're seeing them in orbiting binary stars, like Tatooine did in Star Wars. Um, we're seeing them around dwarf stars. We're seeing them around giant stars. We're seeing them around stars that have exploded. Uh, they're everywhere. And we're getting good at seeing them, not just close into their star, but farther out. We're seeing planets more massive than Jupiter. We're finding planets less massive than the Earth. Um, and we've only found fewer than 1,000, okay? There are 200 billion stars in our galaxy, and we've only looked at um, legitimately a few thousand of them. And yet we're finding all these planets. And so the, the idea is now is you can start doing statistics and say, how many do we expect to find in our galaxy? And the answer is hundreds of billions. Planets probably outnumber stars in our galaxy. On average, each star has a planet or more. Some of them don't have any, probably, but we have nine or 10 or eight or whatever you want to say. We have more than one, so we make up for other ones. Um, then you have to ask yourself, well, how many can support life? And that, that gets to be stickier because Mars could support life or could have a billion years ago. So could Venus. Um, life could be on Jupiter's moon Europa. It could be on Saturn's moon Enceladus. So there's a wide range where life could exist. But even being really narrow-minded, even being racist, if you want to think of it that way, I guess it would be lifist, bioist, biologist. Ooh, can you use that as a, ooh, I just thought of that. I like that one. So even being biologist um, and saying it has to be an Earth-like planet at temperatures where liquid water can exist because we need that, um, that changes for, the, for stars, right? A hot star, you have to be farther out. A cool star, you have to be closer in, all that kind of stuff. Even then, you, you do, take all that into account. How many Earth-like planets are out there? And the answer is probably millions, millions of them, maybe billions. There could, and when you expand those parameters to things like Mars and all that, there are probably billions of habitable planets in our galaxy, or potentially habitable. We know that life arose on Earth the moment it could get a, well, not a toe hold, but a pseudopod hold or whatever <laughs> these things had. Um, the Earth was hot and extremely hostile for, for life, and then it finally cooled down. And probably within 100 million years of conditions being good, life started up. And that's out of a 4 billion year history of this planet. So um, it's amazing. Life has been on this planet for more than three quarters of its age. As soon as life could, could form, it did. So um, it seems to me that life forms pretty easily. That's what that's telling me. Um, there are probably billions of planets out there. So it strikes me, statistically speaking, that there must be life out there. It, it's almost crazy to deny it. We have not found it yet, so we do not know. We don't have that sort of truth. But it seems extremely likely. So when people say, do you think there's alien life out there, my answer is unequivocally yes. Scientifically, I have to say maybe. But as a person, I go, oh yeah, yeah. Now, is it visiting us? No. Um, most of that life is going to be some sort of yeasty, scummy, algae thing coating the surface of the ocean. That's what the Earth was like for billions of years. Um, and and it, it starts getting into mathematical arguments. But we have been capable of communicating um, across interstellar distances for only about 100 years, out of, out of humans being on Earth for a couple of hundred thousand years. Um, once, hopefully, once you develop that technology, you don't lose it. Now, that's part of the Drake equation, right? This thing that says out of how many stars there are planets, how many planets are, are uh, livable and all that. And then there are these factors that say how long your civilization is and whether you destroy yourselves or not. If you destroy yourselves, you're done. Um, if you don't, you know, we are on the edge of a precipice here. We have the capability to extend our lives. Our, our average lifespan is three times what it was. We have the ability to go to other planets, which means an asteroid impact can't wipe us out, which means a solar flare can't destroy our civilization which means we can basically, as a species, become immortal. We can colonize the galaxy in a few million years, even without faster than light travel. There's a very clear equation you can use and say, how long would it take, assuming it takes 100 years to get to another star, how long would it take to populate every star in the galaxy? And the numbers come up to be like 10 million years. 10 million years is a tiny, tiny slice of the life of the galaxy. The galaxy is 10 billion years old. Even if, even if the Earth formed early, you know, there could be an, another planet out there could have formed a million years ahead of the Earth. 
So there should be a civilization out there a million years ahead of us. Or 10 million years, it's nothing. A hundred, a billion years, it's nothing compared to 10 billion. So if there were civilizations out there capable of coming here, they should be here. Not only that, they should have populated every square inch of the galaxy. Excuse me, every cubic inch of the galaxy. I needed three, three-dimensionally. Um, and, there, and I don't see them. I just don't see that evidence. I, the pictures, the blurry pictures uh, don't convince me. Um, people's claims of being abducted don't convince me. Those con uh, eyewitness testimony is not very good. And people say, what would convince you? It's like, well, you know what? I will take a flying saucer landing on the White House lawn. Um, that would be acceptable. Un even, but even then, it's like under certain circumstances, because that could be faked. Um, if they had, I saw it in a couple of movies, right? I, I saw Day of the Earth Stood Still, the real one. Um, and uh, 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 if, if an alien came here and said, here is a piece of knowledge that you cannot possibly have. Here is how faster than light travel works, for example, and then we build one and it works. That would do it. Um, it had totally different biology than we do. Um, there's a planet orbiting a star 50 light years from here and its continents look like this. This is something we can discover for ourselves in the next few decades. We'll have telescopes that can do that. So anything like that, but I just haven't seen that. The knowledge people always seem to have from these aliens is be nice to each other. And you know, that's like, that's what angels have always said. And so, so it, it seems to me that that's, Carl Sagan said this, that these sort of people who talk to angels may, and people who talk to UFOs, it may be some sort of psychological thing that, that's just in our psyche to do that. I don't know, but I just don't see the evidence. I need hard proof if you want to make a claim that extraordinary, and I haven't seen it. Um, the proof is there for planets orbiting other stars, but not for anybody coming here and talking to us about them. That was a really super long answer. I have, I have opinions about some things, I think. That's, that's probably what's going on. Yes, over here. And y'all can leave. You don't have to stick around. <laughs> I think the idea that made that supernova radiation could affect the sun now drastically, that had like this year. Could affect what, sorry? Could affect like the Earth's past past life. I'm I'm sorry, I just couldn't hear the last thing you're saying. The radiation of the recent supernova could affect us in some way. Oh, just affect us in some way. Okay, I'm sorry. Um uh that's chapter five of my book. Um <laughs> Not that I'm trying to plug it, but, uh, but uh, the quick answer is um, stars blow up. Some of them do. The sun can't, but some of them do. Betelgeuse will. Uh, it's not even the closest. Spica, which is the brightest star in Virgo, is actually the closest massive star that can blow up. There's another one that might actually be closer than that that could blow up, but it's a, it's, it's a different kind of star. Um, when they blow up, they give off vast amounts of energy. Basically, the amount of energy the sun will give off in its entire lifetime will be given off in a matter of weeks by these stars. Incredibly violent event. Um, but you can calculate how much energy they give off. And because they're far away, that energy fades with distance, right? Something farther away is fainter. And you can calculate how close a supernova has to be to damage us. And it turns out there are different ways. There's a flash of high energy radiation called gamma rays that can do one thing. There's x-rays, there's ultraviolet. Um, there's a physical pulse of material that can slam into you, although that takes thousands of years to reach you. Um, there's all these different things. And it turns out um, uh, the, the, it has to be the, the closest it can be, excuse me, yeah, the, 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 let me rephrase that whole thing. The minimum distance a supernova has to be to do any kind of damage to us is very roughly 100 light years. Um, for some things it's closer, for some it's farther. And there are different kinds of supernovae. There's this one thing called a gamma ray burst that has to be, that can be 8,000 light years away and still hurt us. But those are extremely rare events. Um, but with a supernova it has to be super close. And there just isn't anything that close that can hurt us, we think. And certainly nothing that close that can hurt us in any sort of reasonable time scale. Um, this one star that's under 100 light years away, IK Pegasus, which I'd never even heard of until somebody told me about it a few months ago. And I was like, whoa, and I was reading about it, so I couldn't believe it. It's like, there's actually a star that could blow up that's pretty close. But it turns out that it probably won't blow up for another million years or 50 million years or something like that, and it's, it's moving away from us. So realistically, by the time it blows up, it'll be too far to hurt us. So that, that's how close. Um, now, if you put a gamma ray burst 100 light years away, it would set the world on fire. Um, it's an incredibly violent event. But again, there's nothing anywhere near that close that can hurt us.